please put your hands together for Owen Kelly. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> that was tension building, wasn't it? <laughs> I'd just like to give a shout out to the more pork, which was not mentioned earlier. There's a lot of people quite angry about that over there, but we'll talk about that afterwards. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let me just make sure this thing's turned on. All righty. Uh, my name is Owen Kelly, and this morning we are going to talk about Hello World. Hello World. It's the first program we all write, more or less, and it seems like a pretty appropriate topic for the first talk of the day at the first ever conference here in New Zealand, Ruby Conference. So that's really exciting. I, I want to give a big thank you to the organizers for making this happen, because it's really cool that we have one of these in New Zealand now. Uh, we have a lot of content to get through this morning, so I'm not going to stop for questions, and if we have any time at the end, we'll do some, but otherwise, if you have questions, just come talk to me afterwards. I am more than happy to yarn about this stuff. All right. How does Hello World work? How does it really work? Well, that seems like a straightforward question, and we're going to answer it today in two parts. First part, we're going to talk about the string bit, the Hello World bit. Second part, we're going to talk about the puts bit. So let's start with a question. How do we represent human writing on a computer? Well, what is writing? Well, <laughs> yeah, we're going deep this morning. <laughs> Writing systems are made up of symbols, and what these symbols represent can vary greatly between the writing systems. Sometimes they represent whole words, sometimes it's syllables, and sometimes it's just the basic sounds. So for example, English, basic sounds, we have an alphabetic writing system, but there are writing systems which have all three, such as Japanese. And do the various human writing systems have a nice, clean relationship with each other? Nope. Writing systems evolved over time borrowing and stealing from each other in an overlapping, messy way. Um, so this messy, overlapping relationship uh, means that some symbols are shared between many writing systems. So the A shape we see here uh, is a symbol in over 130 different writing systems. And this reuse of shapes, however, gives us a clue as to how we should model writing on a computer. If we can represent the shapes themselves, then maybe we can let the interpretation of the rest of it to happen in the human brain. So happily, you and I don't have to figure this out from scratch because the snappily named Unicode Consortium has done it for us. Um, they've already done the hard work to define these shapes, and they've called them characters. Most of us have at least heard of Unicode, but we might be a little bit fuzzy on what exactly it is. So Unicode is a set of standards about how we represent and manipulate text in computers. This morning, we're going to just discuss just three of the things, that you, the many things that Unicode does for us. Decides what is and isn't a character, gives each of these characters a name and a number, and finally, describes how to make these numbers uh, be representable as bytes in a computer. A lot of the value in Unicode is as an anti-bike shedding tool about what exactly a character is. So suffice it to say that language is complex, so the definition of what a character is in linguistics is not straightforward. There can be multiple correct answers to that question. Um, happily for us, as software developers, we can ignore all of the ambiguity of the linguistic definition and use this simplifying assumption that we accept into our hearts that a character is whatever Unicode says is a character. <laughs> the Unicode, a little bit like your time zone library, is the outcome of a mildly heroic amount of cataloging and consensus building. And we really, really want to make use of that. Much of the Unicode spec is just a large catalog of characters, each with an assigned number. And while this isn't super interesting in a technical sense, it's a massive accomplishment to provide a set of shapes that most humans on the planet can agree is good enough to represent their writing systems, both current and historical. The numbers are called code points, and are typically represented as either decimal or hexadecimal, and sometimes the hexadecimal notation has a U plus in front of it. In order to meet the ridiculously ambitious goal of having this planet-wide system of representing and manipulating text, many compromises were made to keep as much compatibility as possible with the existing character encoding standards of the early 1990s when Unicode was becoming a thing. So that's a really long-winded way of saying that Unicode is messier than we would like. So let's look at some examples. 
Here we see the English word hello. We also see a snippet of the Unicode spec and, Unicode and Ruby's code points method. So the code points method on string, as you might imagine, uh, returns an array of decimal numbers uh, representing the code points in that string. Uh, so remember that Unicode characters are the building blocks of symbols in a language. They are not the symbols in a language. Uh, however, what we see here is the common case where there's a one-to-one -one mapping between these things. So it's really easy for us as English speakers to think that this is the universal rule. Um, but it is only the, the common case. So leaving English behind for a moment, let's look at a word from the Irish language, Cauca. And we see that the Unicode toolkit gives us two ways to build this word. The first version uses the snappy named Latin small letter A with a cute which is a single code point which represents the A with that diacritical mark uh, over it. The second version combines two separate code points to achieve the same result. So both of these versions are valid Unicode. Why is there more than one way to create symbols in Unicode? Well, languages have a lot of shapes and it wouldn't be feasible to have a separate code point for every possible combination of shapes. However, for historical reasons and compatibility reasons, some combinations have been grandfathered in, so to speak. By the way, we don't have diacritical marks in English, so let's take a moment to emphasize that these marks are not optional in the languages which do use them. So Kolka is a good example of a word where the diacritical mark, in this case called a fada, really matters. Kolka is the Irish word for cake. Tame egeha Kolka, I'm eating cake. Delicious. Kaka, without the fada, well, <laughs> let's just say it doesn't mean cake, and you really don't want to mistake it for cake. <laughs> All right, one more example. Unicode partitions the, it, the available code point numbers into chunks. Each of these chunks is called a plane, and most of the characters we use for day-to-day -day communication are on the kind of boring named uh, basic multilingual plane. Uh, the other chunks, these higher planes, are collectively referred to as the astral planes. So what characters live on the astral planes? Well, emoji do. So here we see an example of one of the many Unicode family emoji. And we see that it's built with no less than seven code points. When we run Ruby's cars method on the string, we see that the family group is actually made up of the code points for each individual face combined with the zero width joiner point. So this illustrates an important point. Many Unicode characters do not have a visual or spatial representation. We're pretty familiar with things like carriage return and line, uh, new, new line characters, but Unicode also has things for controlling things like writing direction and the different kinds of spacing between letters and uh, words. The third job that we're going to talk about this morning is how we turn those code point numbers into bytes. This process is called encoding, and Uni Unicode provides three options for this. So they're all interesting in their own right, but in the interest of this not being a five-hour talk, we're just going to talk about one of them, um, the most popular one, UTF-8. So we have just talked about the messy part of the Unicode spec, where it tries to wrangle human history and writing down into a collection of stuff. Um, so that's the messy bit, but this bit is actually really clean and elegant. So UTF-8, which was originally designed by Ken Thompson and Rob Pike, day of the Go programming language. It has been the default encoding for Ruby source files and IO objects since Ruby 2. And it's the most popular encoding for text on the web. Uh, it's just a set of rules that just tell you how to encode a single code point as bytes. That code point will be encoded as between one and four bytes, depending on how big the code point number is. So it works pretty, straight, pretty easy to do. You just take your code point number, find which row on the table applies, convert it to binary, and fill in the Xs with your binary representation of the code point. It'll be a little bit easier if we work through an example. So here we have our friend Latin small letter A again. It has a code point number of, 90, of 97. And we also see the binary representation of that. Uh, first, 
we look up the code point in the table, and obviously 97 is between 0 and 127. So we know that we just need, we need just one byte to represent this in the output. Um, and we also see from the table that there are seven bit places which we can fill. So we take the binary representation of, 90, of 97 and fill it into our output. Easy. Let's try another example. Uh, here we see Latin small letter A with acute. This one has a code point number of 225, and we see the binary representation as well. Uh, same as before, we look it up in the table. 225 is between 128 and 2047, so we know that we're gonna need two bytes to encode this one. And we can see from the table that we have 11 Xs, or there's 11 bit places to fill. So we're gonna take the binary representation of 225 and fill those spaces with it, padding with zeros at the left as required. So important point here, that the binary representation of the code point number fit in a single byte, yet we actually had two bytes in the output. So not, they're not necessarily one-to-one. -one. So UTF-8 has some really neat features. It's very space efficient. Smaller numbers are encoded with less bytes. And as if you're a little bit familiar with uh, the ASCII table, uh, you'll notice that actually it's backwards compatible with ASCII, and that's not an accident. But there's one feature in particular which is really cool. It's self-synchronizing. And that means that given a, a UTF-8 byte stream, we can drop into the middle of it anywhere and very, very quickly find our place. So let's look at an example of this. Here at the top, we see a UTF-8 byte stream. We've missed the start of this stream for some reason. Maybe we were tailing a log from our server. Maybe we have a file and the start of it was garbled. Whatever the reason, our job is now to make sense of these bytes. So how do we do it? Well, uh, well, we look at the first, we, we inspect the first bits in each byte to decide what kind of byte we have. If the first bit is zero, we know that we're looking at a single byte in character. If the first bit is 110, we know we're looking at the start of a two byte character. If it's 111, we know we're, we're looking at the start of a three byte character, and so on. If the first two bits are 10, we know that we are not actually looking at the start of a character, we're somewhere in the middle, so we need to either read backwards or read forwards to find the start. Okay, let's work through our example. First byte up. We look at the first bit, we see that it's zero. Great, so we know now we have a single, uh, a single byte encoding. We can also see from the table which bits represent the code point number. So we find those, convert from binary to decimal, go look up that decimal number in our Unicode tables, and we've got quotation mark. All right, next byte. We can see that we start with four ones, so we see from the table that four ones means that we are looking at the start of a four byte character. And again, the table shows us which bits are uh, relevant, which bits actually contain the code point value. We, can, we pull those out, convert from binary to decimal, and we look that up in the table, and we see we've got a globe. Okay, now we've kind of come to the end of the first part. We're finished with We've learned a little bit about how strings and Unicode and UTF-8 work. Um, now we're gonna move on to the, the puts part of Hello World, and we're gonna do that by going down the stack a little bit and working our way back up. So brace yourself, here comes Assembler. <laughs> so Assembler is kind of the punk rock of programming. That's how I think about it. Uh, the tools are very primitive and raw, the people who are into it look very intimidating and, and fierce to outsiders. So if punk rock is three chords and the truth, then assembler is 300 system calls and the truth. Um, so whether you write your hello world in Ruby, in C, in Go, in Python, in Haskell, whether you duct type or strong static type, once all is said and done, your computer runs machine code and assembler is the closest to writing machine code. So by studying the assembler version of hello world, we're gonna get a little closer to the DNA of hello world. This is Hello World in Assembler. This particular version will only work on 64-bit Intel processors that run Linux, uh, but all variants of Assembler are the same. Uh, there are many more lines of code here than the Ruby version, uh, but ironically, this version does the least amount of work at runtime. So we're gonna return to this, this slide again. So but for the moment, I just wanna drink in the shape of the code. So other than some bookkeeping, which Assembler is very fond of, uh, this code does the same three things that the Ruby version does. First, we define some data. Here, we're just finding a string and a length. Then, we print that string to the output of our terminal. 
Then we exit the program. One, two, three, same stuff that Ruby does. Okay, we're gonna come back to this, but in order to come back to it, we need to talk a little bit about how computers actually run code. So, sometimes we use the word program to mean a lot of different things. It can either mean the file that lives on disk, um, or it can mean the thing that lives in memory as we're running it. So now we're gonna switch to the uh, more precise terminology of calling it a process. Uh, the process refers exclusively to the thing which runs in memory. So your process is, lives in a computer simulation built for it by the operating system, by the kernel. So the simulation created by the kernel makes our process think that it has access to all available memory. So like this map here, the world looks very big from the point of view of a process. And the operating system kernel enforces the rules of this world. And one of those rules is that all access to the outside world has to go through the kernel. So to reiterate, this process has to ask the kernel if it wants to send and receive anything with the outside world. And by the way, the world in, of this, outside this simulation is, includes things like your keyboard, your hard disk, everything. So this simulation is very, very small from, when viewed from the outside. So the previous slide, we had mountains and rivers in a world, but the world that a process lives in has very different features. And the world of a process is made up entirely of storage areas. There are 16 very small but very fast areas called registers. They have quite inscrutable names, mostly for historical reasons. You can kind of see that there was a uh, kind of an ABCD kind of a vibe happening here. And then there was some other registers which are named based on the tasks they did. And at the point we went from eight registers to 16, we just gave up on the names and just started numbering things. Um, as well as the very small, very fast register storage areas, we have main memory. And this is all of your RAM. So this diagram, not to scale. Um, <laughs> Uh, so main memory is partitioned into five areas. We have the code area, so that's where the instructions for your program will, will live. We have two areas that store global data. So the data area stores anything that's compiled into your program. BSS is an area where your program can reserve, reserve uh, space at compile time. We have the stack. I'm not gonna go too deeply into the stack today, but suffice it to say that it's a scratch space where your program can keep track of uh, like things like local variables and which functions have been called and such. And then we have the heap, which is the junk drawer of memory, is that ev everything else your process needs to do, it does on the heap. Okay, so this is the map of the world that the kernel builds for our process. And when we run a process, it pulls the file off disk and unpacks it into this world. So as we discussed already, a process can't really do anything for itself. It can run computations and shuffle data between the various storage areas. But that really, all that will achieve is uh, heating up the CPU. So if it wants to do anything, uh, we actually have to make system calls. So how do we do this? How do we make these requests? Well, it's a two-step process. You load the details of your request into, a specific, into specific registers and then the process issues the very the special syscall instruction. So together, these things are often referred to as making a system call. It's asking the kernel to do something for us because we're completely dependent on it. So once things have been loaded into registers, uh, the, it, the kernel will uh, read, the, read those registers, run, do whatever it is being, has been requested to do, put the results back into the registers and give control back to the process. So we can see a snippet from the, do, uh, the docs for the write system call. Uh, here the racks register gets loaded up with the, what we're calling a system call number. So we we're gonna return to what exactly those are in a moment. And the second parameter to write uh, is the file descriptor number. So it goes into the RDI register. So it's worth talking for a moment about file descriptors. A file descriptor is just an integer which represents a file that the kernel has already opened for the process. So why does reading and writing files matter to a program like Hello World, where we don't, there's no opening of files in that code? Well, as part of its simulation that the kernel builds for a process, it opens three files for it. And these three files are wired up to the input and output of your terminal. Um, so from your process's point of view, when you are reading data from your terminal or writing, putting some stuff out on the terminal, it's actually reading and writing to a file. So these files are opened for every process, no matter whether it wants them or not, um, and they get the file descriptor numbers of zero, one, and two, 
but we probably know them better as standard in, standard out, and standard error. And the rest of the parameters here just tell write where, where to find the data, and how much to write, and so on. And how do we know which system call numbers to use? Well, it's not fancy. The people who write the kernel maintain a big table, and you go look it up. Um, so here we see a snippet from the uh, Linux system call table. We see that if you are a process running on a Linux machine, there are 328 different things you can ask the kernel to do for you. Uh, we're going to pay particular attention to write and exit, because they are going to come up in our uh, quite a lot for Hello World. And they have system call numbers 1 and 60, respectively. OK. Now we've learned a little bit more about how uh, computers run processes. Let's look again at our assembler. Um, and to help us, we're going to bring back the docs. Uh, assembler is very much not designed for programmer happiness. So having the docs open at the same time as your code is pretty much a prerequisite. Um, but it's the same code as before, and it does the same stuff. We begin by defining some data values. It's a kind of a weird way of the syntax. So don't worry too much about the syntax, but the general gist of it is we're defining a string and, and a length. Um, and then next bit was we printed that string to the output of our terminal. So here we see that we, are, we have four uh, instructions where we're loading up registers. We can see that the racks register gets loaded up with number one, which is the system call number. And in that case, one is right. Uh, we see that RDI gets the file descriptor number, which is one, which in this case means standard output. So we are writing to the file, which is standard output. And the other two uh, parameters are also loaded up. So we load up our registers, issue a syscall, easy. Next, to exit the program, same pattern as before. Load up some registers, issue a syscall. In this case, 60 goes into racks to choose the exit system call, and then we put the exit value in RDI. OK. I want to pause here and note that the system call interface hides a ton of complexity. So most of the complexity of what your program does is hidden behind that system call interface, which is to, which is to say that assembly language has a lot of magic. So there's magic at all levels of the stack. Right, so we know that system calls are very important. Um, wouldn't it be great if there was a way for us to find out what system calls an arbitrary program is, is using? So we can, there's tools to do this on all operating systems, but we're gonna look at a Linux one called strace. So here we see a command line where we're just, you simply pass your program to strace and it prints out what system calls you made. And here we're, we're running it on the assembler version of Hello World. So as you might expect, First call we make is write. Again, we see we're writing to file descriptor number one, the string we're writing and the number of bytes, and we also see the exit call. So this maps very nicely with the assembler code we saw on the previous slide. What would happen if we ran strace on the Ruby version of Hello World? Well, the output for the Ruby version is a lot more verbose, whereas our assembly version uh, had two system calls. The, Ru the Ruby version had about 1,200 on my system when I ran it. I've removed most of those lines to keep this slide a bit sane. Uh, but suffice it to say that pretty much all of them are Ruby loading libraries and gems and files that it needs in order to start up. Uh, but again, the same shape applies. Here we see Ruby actually loading our Ruby script. We see an open call, which uh, loads the script and returns a, a number, which is the file descriptor. And then we see us reading from that file descriptor. This is Ruby sucking in our Ruby script. And later on, we see the write call. Um, so this is the result of puts. Um, again, we're writing to one, which is standard out. Interestingly, we <coughs> we'll see that puts uses two write calls. It puts the new line in a second write call. So <coughs> the story begins with Ruby loading a script file. And now we kind of have a, we have the postmortem of what happened. So we've got the end of the story. We've got the beginning and we've got the end. How do we join these together? So in order to do that, we're gonna dig into Ruby itself a little bit. So this is a very high level overview of how MRI Ruby works. Ruby is a machine which consumes code points and emits system calls. So at the top, we see our Ruby source code coming in. It goes through three transformations. There's tokenization, where we turn that source, the, those code points, into an array of tokens. We've got a parser, which turns that array of tokens into a, a tree structure called an abstract syntax tree, or an AST. The AST gets fed into the compiler, which spits out YARV bytecode instructions, and then the YARV bytecode is run in the YARV virtual machine, which actually does the work and issues the system calls. So there's a lot going on here, 
And again, in the interest of it not being a five-hour talk, we cannot talk about all of it, unfortunately, so we're just going to focus on one little bit, which is the YARV bit. Um, YARV stands for yet another Ruby virtual machine, and it's the engine within Ruby that actually runs our code. And before we can dig into it, we need to do a very short refresher on how uh, Ruby method calls work. Ruby's point of view is that what we sometimes call, refer to as calling a method, is actually sending a message to an object. So using this terminology, we see that the object is the receiver of the message, and the method name is the name of the message. So how does a bear puts in hello world work? Well, as you may or may not know, if you omit the receiver, uh, Ruby will assume that the receiver is whatever self points at. And what self points at depends on where you are in your code. So if you're in a method within a class, self will point at the instance of the class. But if you are not within a class or a method, uh, Ruby creates a special instance of object for us, which it calls main, and that becomes the uh, self for top level stuff. Okay, so puts desugars to self.puts, which desugars to sending puts to the special main instance of object. With that out of the way, we are ready to look at some YARV. So here we see the Ruby hello world with the corresponding YARV uh, bytecode. So cleaned up a little bit but essentially, hello world becomes four YARV instructions. So YARV is what's known as a stack-based virtual machine. That just means that when an instruction runs, it will pull any arguments it needs off the top of the stack, and any return values it has, it will put them back on the stack. Uh, in fact, there are many instructions which exist just to put stuff on the stack for a later instruction to use. All of those handily begin with put. Okay, let's run this. We start with an empty stack. First instruction up is put self. We know that put self is gonna put something on the stack and we know that self in this case is a reference to our main object. Great, next up, put string. Not too, uh, not too hard to figure out what this one might do. We're gonna put a string onto the stack. Okay, so the next one seems more complicated but we'll walk through it and I think it's pretty okay. It helps if you know that opt stands for optimized as we discussed in the previous slide, Ruby thinks of method calls as message sends. So that's, so we've got some sort of optimized message send. So I think what we can infer from this name is that Ruby has an optimized path, an optimized instruction when you want to send a message where you didn't provide a block. That makes sense here because in our Ruby code, we didn't provide a block to puts. Um, <clears throat> cool, so we're sending a message. What message are we sending? Well, that's here in the output as well. Um, and we also have an arg count. So the reason we need an arg count is that this method in YARV is going to pull the arguments it needs off the stack. So it needs to know how many to pull. Um, we are passing just one argument to puts uh, to this message. So uh, that's how many we're gonna pull off. So let's run it. First thing up, uh, the method will consume the arguments off the stack. Then YARV will assume that the next thing on the, the top of the stack is the receiver. So it's gonna consume that and then it's going to send the puts message to that receiver object with the arguments, and that's gonna happen uh, in C code actually in this case, and the result is gonna get put back on the stack. So the result of puts is nil. Um, and then we have the leave instruction, which in our case just finishes our program. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our little tour of Hello World. We dug a little beneath the surface of the computing stack that we use every day. We learned about strings and Unicode. We learned how a diacritical mark can be the difference between a good time and a bad time in an Irish cafe. <laughs> there are, of course, deeper layers, and there's more detail at the layers we've talked about. But what I want you to take away from this is that while our programs sit on a very large amount of detail, it is all stuff that was created by other people. So you can actually understand all of it as long as you split it up and try to deal with it one piece at a time. If you want to keep digging, then these resources make for pretty good shovels. Um, I'll tweet a link to this later, so don't worry about having to take everything down. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I hope you had as much fun as I did.